I certainly wouldn't expect anybody to be able to time the events that are about to happen with oil prices. I have developed my new premise. I'm calling it the oil spike and fade. There's all these forces that are pushing against themselves. There's a lot of things that are going to happen that could potentially spike oil prices very dramatically in a very short window of time. And at the same time, there's a big overall pull lower on oil prices because of slowing of the global economy, a few other factors. We're going to get into that in this video, tell you what the oil spike and decline is, what to do about it, what it looks like, what it means for you. Also in this video, throughout the whole thing, I want to talk about a lot of the things that I've gotten wrong. I've gotten plenty of things wrong. I want to talk about those in this video. And lastly, please excuse the construction mess. A lot going on here. We'll talk about it later. A premise I've had in the past is that gold prices were going to increase a lot. And from much lower levels, they've climbed to record highs everywhere, every country, every currency on the earth. We were looking at things like I would show you the central bank buying trends. I talked about all the reasons the monetary creation is just going to keep liquidating the value of the dollar and therefore make things like commodities appear higher in price or be higher in price. Here is from 2023, the full year of the buying and selling among world central banks. Here's the top five countries and the bottom five countries. And this premise has only partially played out. Gold prices have a lot higher to go. But what I was wrong about was the gold mining stocks. And I can argue I'm not wrong, I'm just early, but being early is the same as being wrong, so I count it as being wrong. I expected gold mining companies, especially the high quality ones, to do dramatically better than they have been. I also believe that they're set up right now for what will be one of the biggest, most profitable trades most people have in their lifetime coming up. But one of the things I always say to you is that I put my money where my mouth is. And also I tell you that I tell the same things that I would say to you. I'll say to my girlfriend or my son or my father or my good friends. And my son's investing $100. He's asking me where to invest it. And I have to say, and I'm going to put him into Newmont Mining or some mining company, gold mining company, a big one, because this is going to be one of the most profitable trades. It's clearly obvious that gold mining stocks are going to increase in price. In my opinion, I'm wrong plenty of the time. I had another premise that inflation was going to fall. And it's very important that you remember that that was at a time when inflation had done nothing in recent history except for climb higher. It was also at a time when everything was going higher. And I'm not just talking about inflation. There were stocks, real estate, cryptocurrencies, artwork. Monetary creation was going through the roof. Diamonds went higher in price. Groceries were more expensive. Everything was expanding. And even interest rates started climbing. It was chasing. Inflation went off that way and interest rates chased it right up trying to catch up with it. You always hear that the interest rates have to be higher than the rate of inflation to bring inflation down. First of all, that is absolutely not true. People just say it. That's what they all agree upon. And it is typically commonly plays out that way. I'll say it that way. But you can have inflation at 10%, interest rates at 2%, and inflation can still come down. There are ways this happens. Usually it involves a war, but it happens. There's also at a time when everybody, everybody, especially on YouTube, maybe it gets clicks or something like that, everybody was saying that inflation was going to go higher. You know who I'm talking about, who you saw say it to your face. And then once it started to crest out of the top like I told you it would, I told you also then that once inflation starts falling, it typically falls very quickly, as it has. This is a chart from Trading Economics, and this is the area of the big inflationary balance playing out. But here's another way where I was wrong. I expect it to be more of a bounce or pivot point, sort of create a V-shaped trend, but it's forming, it looks more like a consolidation range. But of course, it's not a consolidation range. You can't have that in a chart of the inflation rate. What this area represents is actually the war between the inflationary pressures that I talk about all the time on this channel and the promised economic damage from the Federal Reserve. 
That's what interest rate increases are doing. They're hurting the economy. They're hurting you. They're costing you more money. They're costing everybody more money. Businesses do. That's why it seems like inflation is range bound right now, but it will eventually break higher. And in the words of just about every other YouTuber a year and a half ago, inflation will go much, much higher. And I had a premise that it was all going to come down together. And that included real estate, which slowed down the whole process, but real estate, stocks, cryptos, bonds. And in fact, from this point here on the chart, you can see this, this is the S&P 500 five year chart. Stocks were doing well, bonds were doing great, cryptos were doing great. Cryptos like Bitcoin were trading for 70,000. So with the exception of real estate, which I got wrong, and we're gonna talk about that specifically in just one second, these things really did rise up to a point and then that's when they started coming down. They came down together. Bonds had a bloodbath, cryptos came down a lot, stocks came down a lot from really highly overvalued levels. And I'll overlay an area of Bitcoin price activity to show you how closely synced up this all was. And I know you know, if you watch these videos, the economy is in a little bit of trouble. There's a lot of good and bad points of everything always. So there's a lot of bad points right now that could put things in a bad situation. There's also a lot going on macroeconomically with the wars breaking out. But I want to be clear that this doesn't mean that there aren't great opportunities. You guys saw Pixelworks we picked on January 8th. There's always great opportunities. We keep them coming to you every week. I was wrong on real estate. I expected it to come down in price dramatically and a lot by now. Here's a chart of the Case-Shiller Home Price Index, a five-year chart. And if you see this little spot there where it's just starting to break, I'll give you a closer look on the one-year chart. But this is nothing. It's too small to be telling you anything right now. Just wait a bit. But I do believe that home prices are going to decline significantly. I still have the same premise. It's just taking much, much longer than I expected that it would. People might say, Peter, how could you not know there was limited inventory? And all this monetary creation is driving prices of homes higher. And interest rates were keeping people from leaving their house or moving. And people would wonder, didn't you understand that the high prices, just the unaffordability is keeping people from moving and further constraining the supply. And what about the fact that there's an insufficient number of new builds? Why didn't you think of that, Peter? Well, I did. Of course I did. But I look at things a bit differently. For example, you're told the economy is so strong. They say, look, we have really low unemployment and the stock market is high. And so people in the mainstream are thinking that means the economy is good. I look at other indicators such as like, oh, I don't know, debt. If somebody pulls up to you beside you in a brand new Mercedes and they say, hey, check out my new car, but they bought it on their credit card, they're not wealthier. They're just more indebted. Our nation is not healthy. Our economy is not healthy. It's just indebted. The entire economy is living off of debt. And we're nearing a point where we won't even be able to pay the carrying costs on our debts. But I got off track. Let's get back to real estate. For example, when homes have surpassed any reasonable level of affordability, that'll give way to some demand destruction. Meanwhile, builders are building a lot. I'll show you a chart of the construction spending. This is from Trading Economics. And I also thought that the recession would be here by now. And that would have put a lot of pressure on home prices by this point. And I haven't forgotten about the oil spike and fade, but I just want to say first that before we get into it, there are some risks here because oil prices will be absolutely unpredictable. No matter who you are, no matter what you know, you could easily get washed out because oil prices are going to be volatile in every direction for specific reasons. And at the end, I'm gonna talk about what to do about this approaching oil spike and fade. But first, before the spikes, we're gonna talk about the fades. An example of something that'll make the oil price fade lower are the weakening economies worldwide. There's a lot of recessions popping up right now and we're gonna get into that, but you tell me. Do debts have to be paid? Are debt levels out of control for people, your neighbor, you, your coworkers, municipalities, the state you live in, the federal government? Is that out of control? And talking about the federal government, that debt bomb, can it just be ignored? Does it have to be paid? If it doesn't get paid, that's a default. There's counterparties. Somebody's getting stiffed if they're not paying what they owe. Are they going to be able to pay what they owe? Are they going to be able to cut costs enough and make enough revenue that they're going to be able to outgrow this unbelievable debt bomb? 
No country in the history of the world has ever made so much debt as we have. And the fact that intelligent people, economists, accountants are looking at the same information I am, and they're not seeing it clearly, that's really freaking me out. People are just not wanting to see it, perhaps. That's the only thing I could suggest. Maybe they don't want to see underneath the curtain or behind the curtain, underneath the rug. They don't want to see it, whatever it is. But here's the Trading Economics 25-year chart of interest rates. And I showed you before, right there is what caused all the problems. Rates were too low for too long, and it became easy for Joe Sixpack to take on $200,000 in debt. They're able to pay the carrying costs, or you buy more home than you could afford. And the Federal Reserve is just like, oh, we were only kidding. And all of a sudden, people are losing their houses. And it's not just that the higher rates make it tougher to pay your bills. Credit card bills are higher. Your auto loans are higher or more expensive to pay for. Your mortgage for sure is higher. But it's also that they're taking people out of the consumer market. You might be interested in buying a car, but you don't want to be saddled with these massive payments now so people don't buy a car at all. So there's people being taken out of the consumer economy, and that's not good for the economy. And again, that's just another force that's keeping real estate prices high because of the lack of inventory, because people are moving. That's an example of demand destruction. Things are getting so expensive that nobody's buying things. They're not able to buy things. And it's important to remember that this is during a time of absolutely insane monetary creation. Here's a chart from the St. Louis Fed of monetary creation. The more money that gets created, the less value each dollar has. And oil is a lot like copper. It's a reflection of economic activity. So there's a lot of declining expectations for economic activity and growth. Here's a chart of the European Union growth and inflation estimates. And what do I always tell you to do with anything? This chart, something you get from me, something you read in magazines, something you see on TV, it always is very important that you check who the source was because they may have vested interests and you want to understand what their motivations are for them to tell you what they're telling you. Are they trying to trick you into taking an action? And so why I'm saying that, this is a great example of that. So this turns out to be from the European Commission. And it's their job to make these numbers go in the right direction and be strong. And then they report on it and they tell you, look at how strong the economy is. But it is true that they do manipulate the numbers to a certain degree, just like in America, European Commission does it too. There's an expectation for a global growth slowdown in a lot of places worldwide. This is from the IMF, International Monetary Fund. We expect that for Europe as a whole, 2023 growth will be 1.3%. It was 2.7% in 2022. The growth rate more than cut in half. If we drop that much again, we'd be in negative territory. But who is in recession right now? Puerto Rico? But listen to this. I found this so interesting. I'm going to read you both. These are two counterposing arguments, so to speak. On March 15th, 2022, a bankruptcy deal came into effect that reduced Puerto Rico's debt by almost 80%. You tell me if they owed you $100 and now they're only going to give you 20 how would you like that? Somebody's getting hit with this, and it's mostly the federal government. The resulting new fiscal plan coupled with an influx of federal dollars marks the effective end of the island's debt crisis. And this is from Wikipedia. Puerto Rican national debt is now approximately $74 billion. But unlike mainland municipalities, Puerto Rico is not protected by Chapter 9 of the U.S. Bankruptcy Code and cannot file for bankruptcy. Israel is also in a recession. BNN Bloomberg says that they expect that their GDP rate will drop by 11%. But of course, they've got a lot of things going on right now in Israel. Speaking of wars causing recessions, Ukraine lost 30 to 35 percent of their GDP in the first year of the conflict. And Associated Press is reporting that Japan is now in recession too. Growth for the previous quarter was also revised downward to negative 0.8 percent, meaning that Japan is in recession defined as two consecutive quarters of contraction. Oh, we're bringing that one back, that old saw. <laughs> I thought we weren't supposed to identify recessions that way anymore. The United Kingdom's also in recession. A few other countries in the EU are very close to it as well, are going to enter it very soon. This is from Al Jazeera. Britain's gross domestic product shrank by 0.3% in the last three months of 2023, after contracting 0.1% in the third quarter. So all these recessions, all this economic 
slowdown is going to result in less demand on oil. But there's a lot of other reasons why oil prices will decline. For example, calmings of conflicts. If there's a big risk premium built into oil prices because there's a big war right in the Middle East, and then that calms down, that takes away the risk premium and therefore the price is lower. And there's other things too, like new energy fines or incentives from the government, controls by the government as well. And you don't need to predict where oil prices are going. You need to predict where economies are going. So if you know that economies are slowing down, that means they're using less oil and therefore the demands on oil decrease and therefore the prices generally go lower. There's also other factors too, such as OPEC and the decisions they make. There's lots of stuff going on in oil. This is going to be almost impossible for anybody to call until we get through this current period that we're in. Oh, you've waited long enough. Let's talk about the things that are going to spike oil prices. All of these are terrible. I hope they don't happen. You hope they don't happen. Everyone hopes they don't happen. But Israel is very likely to invade southern Lebanon. That will be going against Hezbollah and dramatically expanding the war. Israel also has just taken out two natural gas pipelines on Iranian soil. That's a major escalation. This war is not going to be coming down at all. Things in the Red Sea are getting way more active now, too. Germany is even bringing warships there to help out. Even with the Houthi rebels, there's all these supply disruptions. Russia's even bragging about their new space weapon. It's basically a nuclear satellite they just throw up there and goes around and they can blow it up whenever they want, take it a bunch of satellites. But the point is, if a war breaks, like a real war, like World War III level kind of stuff, satellites are going to be getting taken out. North Korea knows how to do this. Russia, China, America, a few other countries too. If you take out a satellite, that changes everything, including missile defense systems, coordination of militaries, everything goes down. And the only other way you get internet is through cables in the bottom of the ocean, which are so long, such a soft target, that it's absolutely asinine to try and have any kind of defense to protect them. Point is that you've got this complex web of macroeconomic events, so many points of which could instantly result in an action that will spike oil prices dramatically. Even if that spike is $1.50, it'll still happen in a very short window of time. Or certain things could happen that would absolutely cut availability, or reroute ships and add to the journey, taking oil delivery longer to get there. So what I did is I broke down the next part to really short do and do not. So do, I would suggest, and this is not trading advice for you, you do what you want to do, I don't know anything. I would suggest that you get exposure to really good, high quality oil companies. And if you want to go smaller, take on a little bit more risk reward, then only invest in the types of oil companies that we talk about in the newsletter. There's a lot of bad stocks in the 2 or $3 range that look good that are not good. So have some exposure to oil. Don't worry about when the prices decline and don't act too soon when the prices rise. I just think it's a good idea to make sure that you're exposed to oil always. Very important. Because anything could happen. In that case, you would have wanted to own a couple of these larger oil companies or some of the specific smaller oil companies that are going to do really well that we talk about in the newsletter. So that's the do. Now it's easy. The do not is I would suggest that you don't trade this at all. If you're trading options, whether puts or calls, I wouldn't go near it. I certainly wouldn't expect anybody to be able to time the events that are about to happen with oil prices. Oil should be, in my opinion, just on the sidelines and ignored. You have some exposure to it, you dip your toes in the water, or you get a good amount of it, whatever you want to do, what's best for you, and you just don't even worry about it, don't even think about it. Just like with gold, that I always tell you, gold's not going anywhere no matter what happens. Get oil, get gold, be exposed to that, and then you can look at things like copper, taking chances on stocks like Pixel Works that we picked on January 8th, stuff like that. And I wanted to say, excuse the mess, as you'll see, I always tell you guys that there's the uh, complete human knowledge available at your fingertips. I learned how to cook, I made a frittata, I'm learning how to do handyman stuff. If you want some of our free learning tools or you want to see why the Peter Lee's newsletter is one of the most popular financial newsletters of all time, swing over to peterleads.com and you can learn all about it.